Um, good morning, everybody. I would like to give you a very warm welcome um, on behalf of the European Policy Centre and our partner for today, the Foreign Economic Relations Board of Turkey, otherwise known as uh, BIC. Um, we're here today to talk about Turkish uh, foreign policy um, in, an, in an uncertain times. I'm very delighted that we're joined here today um, by Ibrahim uh, Kalin, who is the presidential spokesman and chief advisor uh, to the Turkish president, uh, Mr. Erdogan. Uh, welcome to you, uh, Mr. Kalin. Um, before we actually proceed, um, I'm going to hand the floor for a couple of minutes uh, to my colleague um, from uh, DIC, um, who is a board member and also the president and CEO of the Pali Group, uh, Mrs. Zeynep Bodur Okyay. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, honorable spokesman, dear members of TAIC and EPC, distinguished participants, on behalf of uh, Foreign Economic Relations Board of uh, Turkey, I would like to extend my gratitude to representatives of EPC to co-organize only online 60-minute policy briefing, and I would like to thank you all for attending. It's an honor for us to have the opportunity to discuss Turkish foreign policy in these challenging times with Honorable Spokesman and Chief Advisor to the President of Turkey, Mr. Ibrahim Kalın. Mr. Spokesman, thank you very much for making the time to join us today. I know that you are quite busy. Uh, at TAKE, we represent our, about 60% of Turkey's leading businesses, many of which have extensive ties with the uh, European uh, Union. In line with the business uh, diplomacy, we carry uh, out activities uh, uh, for the advancement of Turkey-EU relations from a business uh, perspective uh, mainly. Turkey's deep-rooted uh, partnership with the EU has always been the anchor for our business relations. Uh, both parties have invested a lot in constructing a long-term partnership despite different challenges uh, they face in the past. We believe that uh, Turkey and the EU as two main trade and strategic partners will find a common ground as they did before uh, and Turkey will continue to be an integral part of Europe. Uh, therefore, it's important that we have to talk more to each other and a little bit less about each other. So we hope that today's briefing will be a major contribution to this end and uh, uh, as the dialogue and mutual understanding uh, remain crucial in these uncertain times. So now, without further ado, I don't like to waste uh, your time and uh, Mr. Cullen's time, so I would like to give the floor to Ms. Paul. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Zeynep Hanum. Um, I would just like to start, first of all, by asking the audience um, if they have a question, which I hope they will, to already either type in the question in the box on the screen or alternatively if you would like to verbally ask a question um, to click on the hand that's next to your name on the list. Uh, we actually only have uh, 45 minutes because Ambassador Cullen um, has to leave at quarter two for a meeting um, with the president. So without a further ado, um, I'm going to start by asking um, Ambassador Cullen uh, a couple of questions. Um, Ambassador uh, Cullen, I would like to start by asking you um, about Turkey's uh, policy uh, towards Libya. Turkey has been playing a key role in turning the war in Libya um, in favour of the National Accord government. Turkey has also been um, playing an active role uh, in terms of diplomacy to try and help bring about um, a ceasefire. Uh, we've seen in the last few days there was the trilateral summit between Turkey, um, Libya, um, and Malta. There was also, I believe, yesterday or the day before the visit of the deputy um, Russian foreign minister uh, to Ankara for discussions again um, over Libya. Uh, so diplomacy is going on, but at the same time, Turkey has come under um, significant criticism, let's say, um, from certain actors regarding its approach uh, towards uh, Libya. Turkey has been accused of violating um, the Berlin Conference uh, Agreement and French President uh, Monsieur Macron um, has also said uh, Turkey is playing uh, a very dangerous game um, in the region and with Libya. Uh, and we've also seen in the last couple of days uh, the President of Egypt uh, talk about also um, perhaps putting uh, troops uh, into 
Libya, the, the, the government in Cairo passed legislation to allow the deployment of troops into Libya. So I'd like to um, start off by asking you, could you tell us now um, or clarify what are Turkey's policies and objectives now in Libya? So I give you the floor, Ambassador Colin. Thank you. Uh, thanks for your wonderful introductions. And I want to thank European Policy Center and DAE for organizing this and inviting me. So to start with Libya, as you uh, have pointed out, uh, we have uh, an active diplomacy going on. Uh, we just reached an agreement with the Russians yesterday to form a study group to work on a credible and sustainable ceasefire. I underline this word credible and sustainable because many attempts have been made in the past over the last two years or so uh, to reach different forms of ceasefires and to advance the political process, but they have all failed. And if you look at the facts uh, in, in, um, in, in the wider context of the Libyan conflict, uh, they've been violated by the Haftar side. Haftar side has violated every single agreement since the Abu Dhabi agreement of 2019. And uh, Haftar side has been the aggressive side. And uh, we uh, went to Libya at the invitation of the, the national uh, court government uh, to help them uh, to push back uh, this aggressive uh, behavior. So, uh, you know, we believe that uh, Haftar's backers, which include uh, the United Arab Emirates, Egypt, uh, uh, France, and uh, to a certain extent, perhaps Russia, uh, through Wagner and others, uh, are not really helping uh, the, the peace process there. We supported the UN uh, process. Uh, our president attended the Berlin conference. Uh, the Russians uh, hosted uh, also a meeting, if you remember, in Moscow last year uh, before the Berlin conference. Uh, Haftar did not participate in any of them. He came to Berlin, but you know he, he didn't commit himself to uh, any kind of lasting, sustainable uh, ceasefire uh, there. So uh, I, I think we, we have to get our facts right here. Like who's being the aggressive side? You know who's being on the on the defensive side? Uh, the Libyans uh, had signed an agreement back in 2015. It's called the Libyan Political Agreement, the Sakharat Agreement, uh, and that was uh, the main framework. Uh, to advance the political process, uh, hold elections, uh, and keep Libya united. Uh, it was again the Haftar side that violated that agreement, and most recently, Haftar said about two months ago, he doesn't recognize the, the Libyan political agreement, the Saharat Agreement of 2015 anymore. He wants to be the sole ruler uh, or the sole dictator of, of, of Libya. Of course, the Libyans, the vast majority of them, will never accept this. And uh, the political reality is that everybody has to go back to their 2015 position if there's going to be uh, a credible, sustainable ceasefire, because there is no trust on the, on the, on the part of the government of national accord vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, Haftar, because uh, they see all these moves, calls for ceasefire, etc., as another uh, uh, tactical move to, uh, to gain time, to buy time, uh, to prepare for another attack. Uh, on a larger scale, of course, uh, we, we support, we fully support the political process. We want to advance the political process. We do not want to have any military escalation or confrontation uh, between any groups or countries uh, there. Uh, President Macron has been very aggressive with his approach uh, in Libya. I guess he's trying to assert some sort of a leadership uh, in North Africa, uh, the kind of leadership that I believe he doesn't have in Europe at the moment. He doesn't have the kind of weight that he wanted to hope or want, wanted to have, uh, you know, in, in Europe for, for a number of domestic political reasons, other regional issues, France's long history of colonialism in Africa, uh, and, and all of that. And he's accusing Turkey uh, of uh, being the aggressive side. In fact, even he, he went so far as to call Turkey's action there a criminal uh, action. And this, this is really unbelievable, uh, you know, for the president of, of a country like France to, to say that to another NATO uh, member. Um, we believe that this kind of action um, undermines security in uh, North Africa. Uh, France's support for Haftar also jeopardizes NATO's uh, southern uh, security because uh, there are a number of complicated issues there into which I don't want to go uh, at the moment. But uh, we would like to see the political process uh, move forward. The sooner uh, we reach a political agreement, the better it is uh, because uh, nobody wants to uh, see Libya turn into another Syria conflict, where the conflict is no longer about Syria. Uh, it's a conflict in Syria uh, where you have so many stakeholders. The conflict has become not only regional but also global uh, and has become uh, um, uh, a theater uh, for, uh, uh, you know, flexing muscles and power projection uh, at a time of uh, global uncertainties. And it doesn't really help anybody. 
Uh, we have seen um, the terrible consequences of the Syrian conflict. We have seen uh, the ongoing chaos in, uh, in Iraq. The consequences have been devastating for the Iraqi people, for the Syrian people. We do not want to, to see a repeat of that in Libya. Thank you very much uh, for answering this, this first question. Um, I would like to stay in, in the region um, and now turn specifically to the recent developments in the Eastern, uh, Eastern Mediterranean um, and the renewed flare up of tensions between um, Greece and Turkey um, following Turkey's um, recent announcement that it was planning to drill um, in the waters near to um, a Greek island. We have seen that witnessed a response, a very robust response um, from the Greek authorities, including um, them underlining the fact that they're, they're preparing their, their military um, for pushback um, if, if, if necessary. I mean, I understand that there's been some high, high level you know, discussions between Turkey um, and, and Greece. Um, to try and, let's say, reduce the tensions uh, to, to, or to find um, a solution to the ongoing tensions in the Eastern Mediterranean uh, more generally, because we know this is something that's been going on uh, for a long time. Um, so far, I believe there's no, there hasn't been any uh, answer, answer found. Um, I know as well that Greece has um, called for the EU to place um, tough sanctions um, on, on Turkey. Um, so how do you how do you view the current you know situation in the eastern mediterranean i mean what's turkey's um goal here and how do you see you know a way a way out of the current um the current problem in the region uh, well greece is our neighbor it's an important neighbor uh, we share a lot of history and culture uh, there are uh, uh, greek orthodox minority community in turkey we have uh, a larger turkish muslim community in greece uh, we share a border, uh, we are allies in NATO, uh, and, uh, you know, we, we share a lot. The Eastern Mediterranean and the Aegean, unfortunately, have remained unresolved issues because of uh, uh, maritime limits uh, and continental shell uh, issues. That's pres primarily because of the, the islands uh, and their status in the Aegean and the Eastern Mediterranean. The Greek side has taken rather uh, a maximalist position claiming uh, that the island of uh, Askelerosio, for example, which we call the Mace Island, which is only two kilometers away from the Turkish shore, but only five, uh, about 580 kilometers away from the Greek mainland. Uh, they claim that uh, Mace Island should have uh, a 40,000 uh, square kilometer continental shell area. That is almost like half of uh, Turkey's Antalya uh, Gulf. And that's simply, you know, that, that cannot be accepted, obviously. This is, this is against logic, this is against geography, this is against international agreements. So we do not ag uh, agree with this maximalist uh, uh, Greek position. In regards to the recent NAVTEX that our energy ministry has announced, in fact, this license was given to our uh, energy company uh, in 2014 or 2012, but it was, I think, uh, made public first in 2014. And the area that uh, this ship, Orochre's ship, uh, will be exploring, not drilling, uh, but exploring, uh, is about 180 kilometers away from the Mace Island, Escalarizio. So uh, we, we, we saw the Greek reaction. We, we, we believe it's, it's really over, overreaction. I mean, they, they, uh, uh, I mean, they reacted in a way as if like they're calling was for some kind of a military confrontation. We do not want any kind of uh, uh, military tension or even political tension in the, in the Eastern Mediterranean. There are two components to this. One is Turkey and Greece agree to continental shelf and maritime borders through negotiated settlement. Our president has said on a number of occasions that we are ready to start exploratory talks with Greece, talks that will include all of these issues, uh, maritime uh, limits, uh, exclusive economic zone, the islands, rock formations, uh, geographical formations that are not listed as islands on which nobody lives, uh, but Greek claims for itself, you know, we uh, reject that. 
So it's an intricate geography. Uh, we believe that they, they should all be part of the talks. You know, I've been involved probably, you, you followed, uh, you know, in, in this traffic and our president has, uh, has taken a very constructive approach uh, to uh, advance this process. Chancellor Merkel has taken a lead. Our president spoke to Prime Minister uh, Mitsotakis on June 26 uh, to further this uh, positive uh, agenda. But the Greek side, again, uh, sticks to this very maximalist position. No country in the world will ever accept uh, this kind of maximalist position. If there was something like this, say, between Greece and Italy or uh, between Greece and Albania, I mean, no other country will ever accept this, that, you know, a, a small island only two kilometers away from your shore, but only 580 kilometers away from the mainland should uh, dominate your whole uh, continental shelf. I mean, no, no, no country will accept that. Therefore, uh, we are in favor of uh, negotiations uh, and uh, we do not want any tensions there. The second component is about Cyprus because there are disputed areas around Cyprus also. And the Greek Cypriots uh, do unfortunately the same thing, meaning that like the Greek, Greece, <clears throat> they use EU membership uh, as, <clears throat> uh, as, as a bargaining chip or uh, as a source of uh, pressure against Turkey. They go back to Europe and say, well, you know, European Union has to take action, you know, uh, implement sanctions on Turkey. Uh, they talk to the United States and others. This language of sanctions, etc., uh, will not work. Uh, we will never accept language of threats uh, or sanctions. Uh, we are only there to protect our rights. We would like to see uh, equitable and fair sharing of all the natural resources <clears throat> in the eastern mediterranean for the last um, three or four years turkey has been excluded from all the major energy attempts in the eastern mediterranean so-called eastmet led by greece the greek cypriots israel egypt uh ha has completely excluded turkey and every expert you ask any expert energy expert in the world that uh any plan any energy pipeline map, anything of the kind, without Turkey will not be feasible. Uh, everybody, everybody admits this, but for political reasons, for ideological reasons coming from Israel, Egypt, because of our political differences, they have excluded Turkey. <clears throat> and now they want Turkey just to sit there and be imprisoned uh, in the Antalya Gulf. Uh, I don't, I don't want to bother you with all the de technical details, but experts will know when you look at the map, how it is drawn the so-called Sevilla map, which was uh, put together by some uh, academics in the 1970s, uh, is not valid at all. Uh, it, it doesn't define any uh, binding uh, borders or maritime shells, continental shelf or borders for, for any country. But somehow, uh, some people think that, well, that's, that's the right of the Greek side, that's the right of the, the, the Greek Cypriot side. We, we don't accept that. So, in sum, uh, what we would like to do now, and this, this has been our call and we've been involved in these negotiations, uh, is to uh, uh, turn a new page, uh, start the negotiations to address all of these issues, all of these issues, confidence building measures, political consultations, maritime continental shelf, maritime limits, economic zone, etc. We believe uh, they can be uh, resolved through uh, negotiations. But uh, if any country, whether Greece or Greek Cypriots <clears throat> or uh, some EU members, uh, try to pressure Turkey, use language of threats, uh, believe me, it will not lead to anywhere. You just you just mentioned about the the sanctions um, that have been called for um, from Greece um, towards uh, towards Turkey. I mean, clearly this incident. Um, has, is making an already difficult relationship with the European Union um, even more difficult. It seems to me that Turkey's relations with the EU has become, you know, very dysfunctional um, over the last few years. I mean, obviously, the frozen um, accession process, uh, which has been dead for a long time, um, is, is a key part of this. But I mean, there's been a lot of other grievances over the last few few years which have added to the tensions and I would say you know the relationship is more or less now devoid of any any sort of trust um, I mean in the, la the foreign ministers meeting um, last week again 
um, you know, we saw Mr. Borrell on the one side, on the one hand, call for a way to re-engage with Turkey to have a dialogue, but on the other other hand, you know, they've been asked again to look for ways to. I don't like to use the word punish, um, but mm. to respond to Turkey's actions um, in in the Eastern Mediterranean. I mean, how do you see now uh, the relationship between Turkey in the EU? Do you think? I mean, how do you think it's possible um, to rebuild the relationship to something that's more, you know, um, it's not just about um, sort of contractual or issue by issue basis, some some way of coming back to the relationship that Turkey had in the past? Uh, our president has spent more time and more political capital than any political leader uh, in, in recent memory to start the EU membership process for Turkey. And he succeeded in that, if you remember, in 2004. And then the official negotiations began in 2005. Uh, I think it's important to remember what happened uh, then and what unfolded since then to this day. We worked really hard. Our president spent, again, so much time and political capital uh, in 2003 and 4 to resolve the issue on Cyprus. And an on plan, uh, which was put on the table by the UN, was rejected by the Greek side, not Turkish side. The Turks, the Turkish Cypriots, supported the Anand plan overwhelmingly in favor of it. And the Greek side rejected it. And that was a big disappointment. Uh, for the UN, for uh, EU countries, for the United States, and all the other key players. Then what happened? Remember, right after the Anand plan, the Greek Cypriot side was accepted into EU as a full member. And EU actually violated one of its fundamental principles, that you don't accept a country as a member if that country has a territorial dispute with another country. They violated this principle in daylight. And ever since then, the Greek Cypriot side has used its membership privilege to pressure Turkey to, you know, create all kinds of problems, anti-Turkey atmosphere, uh, and all of that. I don't want to repeat that history, but I think it's it's important to remember. Now we began the official negotiations in 2005. 36 chapters were presented for Turkey to fulfill membership. Only one chapter was open and closed. 15 years, only one chapter. A uh, number of chapters were open, some were uh, blocked by the Greek Cypriots, some were blocked by the Commission, some were blocked by France, some were lifted, etc. But you see, uh, if you're talking about who is really willing or not willing to make this happen, I think the EU has to look at the mirror and see why they keep pushing Turkey away. And then they come back and complain. Uh, when, when Turkey's legitimate security concerns are not addressed, taken into account, whether it's the fight against the PKK, whether it's the fight against Daesh, whether it's the fight against FETA terrorists, which carry out the July 15 coup attempt in 2016, or uh, energy concerns or other issues, uh, then they come back and you know blame Turkey for uh, developing, uh, or as they call it, cozying up to Russia or looking for other alternatives, etc. But who's pushing Turkey in this direction? I think uh, the main problem in Europe is a lack of uh, visionary leadership. If you look at the map, you're bound together geographically, historically, culturally, more so than any other country. Our president has repeated his commitment to EU membership on so many occasions. But one thing after another uh, leads to this vicious cycle of mistrust, as you have pointed out. Even before the July 15 coup attempt, uh, the PKK has been allowed to run free in most European countries, capitals. Uh, this is re recorded in the official reports uh, of those countries. They collect money, they recruit members, they send terrorists to Turkey. They run all kinds of propaganda against it. Can you imagine uh, Turkey hosting, you know, thousands of people who are intent on destroying, say, German democracy or France's political establishment or uh, Spain's regional government or something? 
how will EU react to that? How will any country react to that? We, uh, not only the PKK, but now in recent years, after the July uh, 15 coup attempt, the FETA terrorists are fleeing to Europe. They are using the system to their advantage against us and poisoning relations between Turkey uh, and a number of European countries. They do this in the United States as well. When the refugee crisis began uh, as a result of the Syrian war, Chancellor Merkel took, uh, I think, a bold initiative and almost single-handedly led the process to reach an agreement. So we reached an agreement, uh, March 18, 2015, migration deal, EU-Turkey migration deal. Who kept the promise and who broke the promises? I mean, let's be honest. Uh, if, if you're talking about this is never a one-sided story. I'm giving you these different examples to, to just remind us all that uh, Turkey's willingness, desire, and strategic commitment to join the European Union has hit a dead wall on the European side. They say, well, you know, we have the enlargement fatigue. You know, the Turkey is doing this, doing that. Um, you know, they always come up with an excuse to prolong this, the, this process. Uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean, these are disputed areas. Why should EU take a side? Legally, EU is not even in a position to take a side on this. Just because one member pressures other members doesn't mean, doesn't give the EU as a body a license uh, or authority or mandate to dictate the view of that particular member. I mean, this is just against logic. This is not you know, in the EU laws, this is not according to international law. These are disputed areas, right, in the Eastern Mediterranean. And we've been saying that, let's sit, talk, and try to resolve this issue through negotiations. The response we are getting is that Turkey should be penalized. Turkey should be sanctioned. For a number of other political reasons, um, uh, you know, different member countries uh, have this anti-Turkey animus and they keep bringing this up uh and uh and it it it, it undermines any uh trust obviously that exists now this is the situation but uh i, I want to be positive i want to be hopeful i think we can overcome these problems as uh, zainab hanum said by talking to each other rather than by talking about each other that requires strong leadership that requires visionary leadership. If Europe wants to be relevant in regional and global affairs, if Europe wants to be uh, a force for stability, for global order, for regional peace, uh, has no choice but to, to work with Turkey, which stands at the crossroads of different continents and regions, etc. Uh, as far as we are concerned, you know, we see ourselves as part of larger Europe. Our economies are intertwined. We still uh, conduct about almost half, 45% or so of our foreign trade uh, with the Eurozone economies. Uh, we would like to increase our trade volume uh, with European countries. Uh, we want to work against uh, common threats such as terrorism of all kinds, Daesh, PKK, any other terrorist network. We want to fight against anti-Semitism and Islamophobia, which have been on the rise in Europe. Uh, we want to work together to resolve the, the refugee issue. And I believe we have a lot to do there. Turkey has been carrying the larger burden here. I think that that's a fact. Everybody admits that. But it's not enough to simply uh, tap Turkey on the shoulder and say, yeah, you're doing a good job. Keep doing it. And then the other side does nothing. You know, we are hosting almost 4 million refugees for the last five, six years. Uh, what kind of help, how much help has been given to Turkey? Uh, we are keeping these people here uh, in Turkey on purely humanitarian grounds. But burden sharing is a reality of our age. And if you don't share burden, whether it's vis-a-vis -vis the refugees uh, or, or other issues, uh, then it becomes one-sided and it, 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 it's not fair. Uh, and then on top of all this, they put all the blame on Turkey. And I'm like, who has called NATO 
having a brain death because sometimes they accuse us of undermining NATO alliance. And I will be very blunt here. Over the last year and a half, the debate about NATO, NATO's strength and relevance in the 21st century, in this age of uncertainty, as you pointed out, has been questioned not by us, but by two prominent members of the alliance. United States, President Trump has said over and over again, that NATO is, uh, it needs to reform itself. Uh, NATO member countries need to spend more on defense. America will not shoulder their expenses anymore, and so on and so forth. And accuse a number of countries by naming them. I don't want to name them here. And that created uh, an interesting debate about NATO. On top of that, President Macron came out and said, NATO is brain death. So who is questioning NATO's relevance and strength uh, as NATO allies? Because NATO and the EU are intertwined in, in, in some contexts. When in fact, uh, we are providing security and safety for the southern flank of NATO. We participate in all the major NATO missions. Uh, we are, our uh, defense spending is uh, at the optimum levels. We contribute to all major NATO uh, uh, programs uh, and, and activities. And on top of that, still Turkey is being accused uh, of, uh, of this and that. So my point is that, uh, you know, instead of this blame game uh, and using language of threat and sanctions and so on and so forth, which will never fly here, which will have no impact on Turkey's sovereignty or determination, to pursue its own national interest. But we believe in cooperation. We believe we are stronger when we act together. We believe all of us are secure when everyone in the neighborhood is secure. And we, we try to realize this goal in Syria, in Iraq, in Libya, in a number of other uh, places. I believe we have a lot of room to work together, uh, but first we have to put aside some old ideological political prejudices, uh, focus on a, a common positive agenda and produce a strong, wider, deeper strategic leadership, a vision uh, that will turn our entire region uh, into a region of peace, prosperity and safety for all. Thank you very much. I would, I mean, to a certain de a degree, I would agree with you that the, I mean, the EU has had a sort of double standard approach um, towards Turkey when it comes to the EU accession process. At the same time, I mean, the EU remains very concerned about um, human rights and freedom of speech in Turkey. Uh, for example, the case of um, Osman uh, Kavala, which remains um, a very uh, important issue for the, for the EU. Um, but I would like to actually take uh, a couple of the questions that we have we have here now because I'm aware we, we only have 10 minutes left with you. Um, so I will read a couple of the ones out that we have typed in. Um, the first question is from Nuruddin uh, Fride, um, who is asking, um, is a war between Egypt and Turkey in Libya um, possible? Um, both sides uh, have contact to a third party. Um, the second question is from Laura uh, Pitel, who's asking, Turkey has invested a lot in building a good relationship with President Trump. What happens to Turkey-US relations if he loses uh, in November? So we'll start with those questions, if that's okay. Yes, uh, we do not want to see any military confrontation or even political tension with any country, including Egypt, Russia, uh, France, or, or any other uh, country. The recent uh, announcement by the uh, Egyptian uh, government and the parliament uh, giving uh, the, the, the government the mandate or the license to send uh, troops, Egyptian troops into Libya uh, is very counterproductive. I believe it will be a dangerous military adventure uh, for Egypt to send uh, troops there. Uh, it, it doesn't help uh, advance the political process. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, again, I think it, it, it shows who, who is really in favor of political settlement and who is really in favor of military confrontation. Uh, there, Haftar has failed. 
And I think it, his backers just need to understand and realize the fact that he's a failure. They cannot work with him. They cannot push, force their way into uh, the Libyan political scene uh, by sending more troops or by sending him more weapons and, and aircrafts, uh, by uh, building up a major military presence in Jufra, uh, controlling Sirte, blocking oil, causing Libya billions of dollars, uh, and creating some kind of a de facto division between east and west of Libya between Benghazi and Tripoli. These are dangerous moves. These are dangerous ideas. Uh, as I've said recently, uh, we've seen similar attempts uh, in Iraq and, and Syria, uh, and the, the, the consequences have been devastating. We should draw lessons from those examples and avoid uh, any, any kind of uh, either division of uh, Libya, uh, uh, de facto, if not de jure, uh, and uh, avoid any kind of military confrontation uh, there. In regards to the uh, second question, um, of course, the leadership uh, relations are important. I mean, leaders talking to leaders, leaders developing good chemistry with each other, uh, you know, uh, is, is important uh, in, in state relations, international relations. Our president has a good uh, relationship with President Trump. Um, of course, it's up to the American people to decide who is going to be the next U.S. president. Uh, but whoever is the next U.S. president, we will continue to work, you know, as two states, um, as two candidates. I mean, President uh, uh, Trump has developed a good relationship with our president, but our president knows uh, 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 former Vice President uh, Joe Biden uh, during, from the Obama period. Uh, we work with him. Uh, uh, Joe Biden actually came to Turkey a number of times, met with our president a number of times. You know, I met him a number of times. So, I mean... We, we, we can only hope for uh, you know a fair uh, run uh, at the election and whoever wins uh, we will be ready to work with them um we have a we have another question here we have a green hand um from osman uh, Celik. i think my colleague can unmute him mr Celik, are you there Mr. Selic, you are self-muted. You have to activate your microphone to ask a question. Okay. Um, I think he's having... Mr. Celic, are you there? Okay. Um, I think he's disappeared from his microphone. Um, so we have we have a couple of minutes left. So I'm, if I may, I will ask you one one closing question. Um, Turkey has sort of traditionally been quite a, a soft power um, player in terms of its foreign policy, but we've seen, you know, in recent times, um, more use of hard power to, you know, to to sort of achieve achieve objectives. Um, is this something that is going to be increasingly the case? in terms of of um of turkish foreign policy i mean we see this with some other countries you know around the world they they use hard power um more frequently for example you know our friends from moscow um so is this a real change in the dynamic of turkish of turkish foreign policy well you use hard power when it is necessary to protect uh uh, your interests uh, prevent war uh, to protect civilians, refugees. Uh, when you have, uh, uh, you know, uh, a, a criminal regime like the Syrian regime in Syria, killing, uh, you know, its own people with barrel bombs and chemical weapons, etc., you don't just sit tight and and say, well, you know, we are a soft power country. Sorry, we cannot do anything for you. You just have to protect them. This is not our choice. This is not our preference. But you just have to do it. When a terrorist uh, organization like the PKK or like Daesh attack you, of course, I mean you have to use hard power. It doesn't contradict uh, your soft power abilities. You need to combine the two, and uh, we have, as you pointed out, uh, I think deepen our soft power capabilities in Africa, uh, in uh, parts of Southeast Asia, in the Balkans, and other places. Even during COVID-19 crisis, the, at the peak time, you know we were able to send uh, uh, medical supplies to uh, uh, you know, tens of countries around the world, including some NATO members like Spain and Italy, uh, United States, uh, but also to Chad, to, uh, uh, to Somalia, to the Palestine, uh, to many other uh, countries around the world uh, that are not that rich or, uh, 
or wealthy. And uh, uh, so we have uh, the soft power ability also, but we would like to combine the two and, uh, and reach the status of a smart power. Uh, you use hard power when it is necessary as a defensive force. You use soft power uh, to reach out uh, and you combine the two. You use smart power not for your own uh, selfish interest, but to uh, create a, an environment of win-win situation for all players and actors uh, so that uh, you know, if you want your house to be safe, you want your neighborhood to be safe. And if you want your neighborhood to be safe, you want your city to be safe and so on. Uh, and th this is, uh, that's why, uh, you know, whether it's in the Mediterranean, Eastern Mediterranean, we are open to any constructive ideas, whether it's in regards to the EU membership, if you would like to continue that process, we would like to finish the negotiations on the uh, customs union, updating the customs union. We would like to get the Schengen visa resolved uh, so that Turkish citizens can travel to Europe like many other um, uh, country uh, citizens. Uh, we would like to see an updating of the Turkey-EU migration deal uh, so that we can deal with the migration issue in a, in a fair way uh, and uh, we, we prevent uh, terrorism uh, from becoming uh, a menace to, uh, to, uh, you know, to the entire region. Uh, we would like to work together to, uh, to fight against Islamophobia, racism, anti-Semitism and other types of ideological uh, discrimination uh, uh, movements uh, and so on and so forth. I think in all of these areas, uh, we, we, I believe we can work together. There are lots of uh, very smart, uh, uh, intelligible, visionary people uh, in Europe, uh, those who understand the realities of the 21st century, uh, those who appreciate uh, the significance of partnership and the role that Turkey does play, is playing and, and will play uh, in the future. And uh, if you bring these visions closer to one another and you know, talk to one another more often, keep the lines of communications open and work on concrete projects, I believe it will be in EU's interest or Europe's interest and in, it will be in Turkey's interest. And when you combine these forces, I think it will be good for the entire world. Okay, I have one last question here. Uh, we have one minute to go, so I, I will read it very quickly. Um, it's from Carolina Jutun who's asking, Turkey has been blocking the defence plan for Eastern Europe, namely the Baltic states and Poland. Ankara wanted certain Kurdish groups to be recognised as terrorist organisations, but in late June, Turkey stopped blocking the defence plan. Could you give some background on how the conflict was resolved in NATO? Yeah, well, it was resolved. Uh, if, if you remember, uh, it, exactly. it was an issue at the NATO And it, it is resolved now, so it's, it's in the past. We look forward now. <laughs> yeah, we all have to look forward. This is this is the approach. Yes, um, I would exactly. like to thank you very much, um, Ambassador Cullen, uh, for joining us here today to addressing um, these topics. I mean, Turkish foreign policy. I think it's going to continue to be in the headlines um, for for the future. Turkey is a, a topic of great interest always. Uh, so thank you very much for joining us. I hope we'll have another opportunity in the future to have you in the European Policy Center. And I wish you a very nice uh, day. Thank you very much. Thanks for your invitation and thanks to the listeners uh, for their patience. Thank you.